the world that you are in and uh, to the conceptual basis of urology course. Uh, you know that uh, this course has started in December last year and uh, there were a couple of presentation on uh, bladder cancer and upper tract urothelial cancer. Uh, last uh, Saturday, we had a presentation by Zubair Chima, who's a consultant urologist at Shokat Khanam on renal cancer, and he provided an overview and a case-based discussion. And all these presentations are available online at the Paus Karachi website. So you can log in and um, uh, you, can, you can see these presentation. Uh, obviously, this is with the permission of the speakers and we will seek permission from uh, Professor Thanos as well to see if he is willing and then his presentation would be available as well. Um, these are some of our uh, forthcoming presenter. Uh, you know, SK Pal uh, is a big supporter of um, urology in Pakistan, and he's uh, one of the big proponents of uh, PCNL, um, and he's gone all over the world. Uh, Ananda Kumar Dhanasekran, who is a consultant urologist in Birmingham has been part of our various academic activities for quite some time. Zishan Afzal, who is a consultant urologist in Dundee in Scotland. Uh, again, he will be our next speaker uh, in, the, in the first week of February. And everybody knows Noor Bukholz and uh, brings a little smile on everyone's face. Uh, so, but today, we are very fortunate that we have Professor Athanasios Papasaurus, uh, a very well-known figure, a big name in endourology and urolithiasis known in Europe uh, and North America and rest of the world. Uh, he has over 200 uh, publications. He has a, a high H index of nearly 40. Uh, he's a full professor at the University of Athens, um, and uh, he doesn't need any further. And uh, in Abu Dhabi WC, uh, I think 2019, he was awarded a very prestigious Arthur Smith Award, which was a, a great thing. So without any further ado, uh, uh, Thanos, uh, the floor is yours. Thank you very much for being part of this course. Uh, thank you very much uh, for uh, the introduction. Uh, I would like to uh, congratulate uh, Professor uh, Ahmad Athar, my good friend, uh, for uh, uh, the very good uh, uh, organization. Uh, and uh, today we're going to discuss and show a couple of videos uh, of uh, disposable reels, flexible gyroscope. They are the new kid uh, on the block. And uh, uh, special thanks again to my good friend, uh, uh, two decades, I believe, at least. <laughs> we don't look too old, but our friendship is old. We so, met in the uh, childhood, uh, Thanos. <laughs> yes, you're right. So uh, for those who haven't visited Greece, uh, my uh, invitation is open and I hope that you will visit Athens uh, where I'm situated and of course uh, have a couple of days at least uh, to the famous Greek islands like Sandorini. Uh, it's number one destination uh, for uh, tourists. Now we are uh, in the middle of east and west and actually we are happy to uh, have very good collaboration uh, with uh, other uh, countries uh, nearby and um, uh, we have also uh, organized uh, the um, SECUR uh, Association uh, regarding urolithiasis uh, in the region, and we have also publication. So uh, when we're going to treat uh, a patient with a stone, we have to decide which of the three popular treatment modalities we're going to use. And publications are in favor, as we all know, for reefs nowadays, more and more publications regarding reefs. Of course, when we're gonna decide uh, which of the three treatment modalities we're gonna use, we have to take into consideration uh, 
factors, uh, parameters uh, of the stone, of renal anatomy, and of the patient. So it's different uh, when you're going to operate on a very obese patient uh, who is on uh, anticoagulants. And it's different if you've got the staph form or uh, small kidney stones. For us that have been trained abroad, we are doing endourology fellowships uh, for a few years. We are in favor of uh, minimal invasive surgery, of course, and we are doing more and more complicated uh, uh, cases. Now, RIFS uh, is uh, very innovative. And now we are actually at the fifth uh, generation of uh, uh, the disposable flexible scopes. You can see here the difference between uh, the first generation and uh, the digital fourth generation. Because when we put the accessories inside, here is a basket, you don't have good deflection with the old scopes. But with the new scopes, uh, things are better, of course. And uh, as we all know, if we are using uh, the lighter digital scopes, it will be easy for us to handle them. This will cause less fatigue to us. We can operate big stones for one to two hours. We will see better, we will zoom better. So that means that we will operate in a safer, quicker and more efficient way. So that means that we need to have the new digital flexible scopes in our hospital. Here you can see a better view with the digital scope in comparison with the fiber optic, the older scope. And also we can accommodate uh, new uh, imaging technologies like NBI, where you can diagnose small uh, papillary tumors in the upper tract. As you can see here, we have the uh, white light uh, uh, standard uh, classical uh, fiber optic scope. And here we've got a small tumor diagnosed uh, with uh, the uh, NBI technology. So we can carry on with uh, some um, uh, literature that you can uh, have a look regarding uh, the cost effectiveness of uh, the flexible ureteroscopy, the single use versus the reusable ones. And uh, as you can see, with uh, the disposable scopes, the new fifth generation scopes, uh, we can operate 20% uh, uh, quicker. So we have this advantage, uh, but we all know that the newer scopes uh, are more uh, militarized, and that means that uh, we have to take good care of them. So the new digital uh, uh, reusable scope uh, have to be taken in very good hands because if uh, we don't uh, follow meticulous maintenance and uh, we don't take good care of the reusable scope, maybe we will have a broken scope and that means that for reusable scopes, we need at least two. Also, the repair is costly and uh, there are sterilization issues. So in conclusion, we need to know that the reusable scopes are uh, the past, but they have also some role in the management of urolithiasis. And we have to take into consideration the fact that uh, we cannot use them for many, many times. So according to literature, after 27 uses, the reusable scope uh, will lose its uh, efficacy. So the only disadvantage of the single use scope is actually the cost. Otherwise, uh, uh, we have uh, all the advantages of uh, the brand new scope for each patient. Also, we've got the advantage of using uh, the, this, the single use scope, the disposable scope by residents. We can use them in infectious cases like HIV or now COVID cases. And we don't have any 
uh, uh, problems with maintenance, repair, or cancellation of the, of the case. So these are advantages of the disposable scopes. And uh, 2018, they were uh, introduced uh, by the EAU guidelines, our European Urology Bible. And uh, if someone would argue that the reusable scopes are cheaper, we have to know exactly the cost uh, of the reusable scopes in terms of buying it, repairing it, realizing it, and also the cost when we have to cancel a case because our reusable scope uh, is not working. So you can see here again with uh, personal communication that I've, ma I've made and also with literature that I've reviewed, 20 cases is the uh, medium number of uh, the uh, reusable scope uses. Here is a reprocessing uh, uh, cycle of a reusable scope where you have to clean it, uh, um, you have to dry it, uh, you have to sterilize it and store it. And uh, you can see that it takes uh, up to uh, uh, two hours. And there are studies where we can actually uh, increase our efficacy if we train better our um, uh, personnel to do all these uh, stages uh, quicker. Now, when we want to compare the usage of the new disposable scopes uh, with uh, the old reusable scopes, uh, we have to take into consideration uh, some facts like the uh, workload of a hospital. And uh, I'll go quickly through these um, publications and I'll end up with this publication where we can see the break-even point of this comparison. So if you've got a hospital that performs more than 100 cases per year, probably the reusable scope is more cost-effective. But if you've got a center that does less than 100 cases, in uh, this center, the digital the disposable single-use scope is more cost-effective. So the general argument that the reusable scope is uh, uh, cheaper is not true. Many parameters should be taken into consideration to discuss this issue with uh, management. Also, you may have cases uh, where you have multiple big stones in the lower pole of the kidney, and uh, in a steep, uh, uh, with a steep uh, angle. And that means that these cases are more difficult to manage with a usable scope. And in these cases, it's more dangerous to break your scope. So probably uh, I would propose that you have in your department both a reusable scope and also a, a single use scope. And in some cases, like these that I've mentioned, you may use the disposable scope. Now we have many and many companies that produce uh, these disposable scopes. We started uh, uh, five, six years ago with uh, the leaf review by Boston Scientific and Pussen continued. Now Pussen uh, is in the third generation. This was the first generation. And we have many, many companies, especially from China, that uh, produce uh, new disposable scopes. This is good because the price will uh, drop down with all the competition. I'm not sure if you are aware of the Leaf of You. It was the first uh, disposable scope in the market. You can see how simple it is, and you can see the chip on the tip uh, technology, and this means it's a disposal, it's a digital uh, scope. You've got the camera here. You don't have a camera here like with the older fiber optic uh, scopes. And uh, this is the Pusen second generation uh, scope, deflection uh, 270, like with the uh, Litho view. 
and a bit cheaper from China. Here is the monitor and here is a deflection. But of course, you can connect the uh, image with your uh, camera that you are using. There are some technical characteristics. I won't go through uh, studies. We have many studies the last two to three years that compare the different uh, disposable scopes, mainly the uh, Boston ones with the Boston scientific ones. It's very important uh, to compare these parameters, resolution, distortion, deflection, and irrigation and flow in its scope. So we have publications uh, that uh, actually will uh, give the advantage of uh, one scope over the other. Of course, uh, it's important uh, to uh, make a good deal with the company. Uh, if you order more scopes, uh, it will be better, that's for sure. So to end up this quick presentation regarding disposable reels, because I want to show you a few videos. There are many advantages with single use reels. We don't have costly scope repairs, maintenance, reprocessing. We don't have um, degradation of the scope performance. We don't need to spend time on manual sterilization. We don't have to care about resistant bacteria and we don't have delays or cancellations to the lack of scope availability. If it's broken or if the washer is not working, etc. So uh, we need uh, to have both uh, scopes in mind in order to use them. Of course, before operating, uh, it's good for residents uh, to do some simulation so that uh, it will be easier for them to uh, get into the spirit of uh, reels. So that was uh, a quick uh, presentation regarding uh, disposable reels. And uh, I can take a couple of questions until I upload uh, the videos. Great, uh, Professor Apasaurus. It's, it's a wonderful talk. Uh, very practical, and uh, you have uh, talked about the technicalities. Uh, can I? Oh, okay. So you're going on to the. No, no, I'll wait for a couple of questions. We have time. Wonderful. So uh, I have a question. Now, one of the problems that we face is that if I use a disposable scope and uh, I have an excess failure, it is charged to the patient. I'm, I, I'm sure that it's, it's different in various different setups. So what we feel is that uh, it, it is a significant charge on the patient uh, because they are mostly paid in the, uh, uh, by themselves rather than from the insurance. And uh, so I basically, what I've done is that uh, that use a, a reusable scope to make sure that I'm going to access today. And uh, it, the only charge would be of sterilization and then uh, subsequently open up a, a disposable scope. So uh, how, how do you look at this problem? Yes, this is a very good uh, tip uh, and it's a solution to a problem. Um, in other countries like in uh, Greece, uh, we have made uh, an agreement with the company and uh, uh, we have all, always a representative uh, uh, site, uh, in the site. And uh, if uh, we open a, sco a scope and uh, we cannot access uh, the uh, upper unit tract, uh, then uh, the patient is not charged. But this is uh, something that uh, depends uh, with uh, each uh, health system. Uh, what you have uh, actually proposed is the best solution because, as I presented, it's good to have in your department uh, both your usable scope and also uh, a couple of disposable scopes. If uh, you have only one reusable scope, you need to have of, of always a disposable scope. If you have two reusable scopes, then it's okay. But uh, in many centers where they had sent off uh, their uh, reusable scope for service or for repair, 
uh, they ended up uh, with cancellations because uh, the other scope uh, had problems. So we always have to offer the best to our patient and uh, uh, having uh, this uh, approach, uh, we can uh, uh, get out of difficult uh, uh, situations, as you've mentioned. Thank you. Right. Uh, <clears throat> I know there is another question on the chat box, and I think Thank a very you. pertinent question. Uh, that's about the disposable of these disposable scopes. So um, what? how much of it is reusable or how much it can be salvaged, uh, recyclable, that's what uh, the question is. And what is the, uh, the methodology in your university? Yeah, that, that's a huge problem uh, regarding the disposable scopes because uh, actually uh, they are uh, uh, not being recycled in Greece at least. And uh, that means uh, that there is a great uh, environmental uh, uh, impact. Uh, and in Greece, it's actually a medical waste and it's not uh, reusable. So uh, it's still a, a big issue to solve, to be honest. Uh, but uh, uh, except for this and for the cost, uh, we have only advantages uh, for the scopes. So I would propose to carry on with the video and uh, then we have plenty of time to go through any other questions because we have 40 minutes, so we have to uh, crack on. So may I go ahead with the video? Please uh, go ahead, uh, Thanos. Okay, so this was a, a challenging case uh, that uh, I used for the first time uh, in the Balkans uh, the 7.5 French uh, single use uh, scope by Bosen. Uh, the other scopes are uh, 9 French, so this is the thinner uh, uterus scope. And always, when you use uh, thinner flexible scopes, you are uh, uh, concerned if uh, they are the they are efficient and you've got a good flow, etc. But I'll go through this case um, uh, slowly and I'll explain everything because it was a recent case uh, that I had to deal a few months ago. It was a, a middle-aged uh, lady with a history of hypertension and she presented to another department uh, with um, uh, nephritis where uh, the urine culture revealed E. coli infection and uh, uh, she received antibiotics, uh, but she was referred uh, to the urologist uh, because uh, imaging revealed uh, quite a, a peculiar situation of a double uh, PC system. The upper PC system uh, was occupied completely by a Stockholm stone. And uh, also, also there were signs of acute nephritis and an abscess. The stone uh, diameter was 5.5 uh, to 0.5, 1.3. And it was about 1,000 household units. And uh, the colleagues, in the other hospital, performed retrograde studies and inserted a JJ stent because uh, they were afraid of uh, uh, urosepsis. Uh, you can see on the uh, left side uh, the unenhanced uh, CT with uh, uh, the dilatation of the upper PC calluses. You can see the stamp form. And uh, you can see also uh, the lower part of the kidney. Enhanced uh, with IV contrast uh, images follow of uh, CT, where again, uh, you can see uh, the stone and the dilated uh, calluses, uh, the upper system, uh, as a thin cortex, uh, you can see over somewhere here the abscess. Um, so this uh, was the X-ray KUB of the stone. You can see that uh, it's um, 
quite a difficult case uh, to deal with uh, with uh, PCNL because uh, the stone uh, ends up to the 11th rib and it's not easy to access it uh, percutaneously. Uh, here is the upper PC and uh, these parts of the stone actually block the calluses. So one, two, three parts of the stone block the calluses. As you can see, they were dilated. And uh, the colleagues in the other hospital did also retrograde uh, uh, studies where they uh, uh, revealed the extravasation of the contrast. Here is the upper PC system and you can see extravasation. Uh, so uh, a JJ was inserted, as you can see, it's next to the uh, stone and uh, the curve of the JJ is in a dilated upper callus. Uh, so this patient was discharged, uh, but uh, after one month, uh, she was again hospitalized in another hospital with acute pyelonephritis. Unfortunately, uh, during her hospitalization, she got infected uh, from COVID-19 and uh, she had to stay at the hospital for six weeks with a Foley catheter because the colleagues uh, believed that uh, with uh, the JJ stent there was reflux and uh, again polynephritis uh, would uh, uh, take place. So after having the stent for four months and unfortunately after having the catheter for four months, she was referred to, to me because again she had polynephritis. Of course the E. coli uh, was present and uh, I had uh, to uh, decide how to treat this uh, patient uh, who suffered uh, in total of uh, five months with all these problems. And of course, uh, during the peak of the uh, second uh, uh, COVID pandemic. So I decided to replace uh, the JJ stand because you know that uh, when you have uh, an active UTI, the foreign bodies are infected. So I replaced the JJ stent. I kept the patient on antibiotics and I decided to have a go with the 7.5 new disposable scope. I was aiming initially to treat this patient with two sessions. And because the JJ stent was in place for so many months, the initial one and the one I changed, I thought it would be very easy to put an access seat and to work uh, with uh, low pressure, because we know with uh, low irrigation pressure, the risk of urosepsis is less, because this is a big concern when you're doing reefs uh, with an active UTI. But as I told you before, uh, it was not uh, easy to have a go with uh, a percutaneous access in this case, and also the patient was uh, quite obese. So it was not an easy case uh, by all means. So three weeks after the JJ replacement, uh, I uh, took the patient to the theater. Here you can see all the equipment on the table, except for the disposable ones. So everything is ready. I uh, also always uh, use a semi-rigid uh, uteroscope uh, to have a look uh, in the ureter and dilate the ureter before inserting an access seat. Always you have to check the disposable scope because sometimes it's not working probably. And this is a problem with uh, the cheap disposable scopes. Usually one out of 10, you open the box and it's not working. So when you check your uh, disposable scope, uh, you have to make sure that you've got uh, the efficient deflection that you want with also the basket, the wire or another accessory in place. Because uh, uh, you have to simulate uh, the operation before starting. Imagine if you've got uh, a flexible scope that has not uh, been working well and uh, it's stuck 
with a deflected angle. There are some cases uh, published in the literature where uh, we had the disposable scopes uh, that had been locked. So these are not easy cases uh, to handle. Always you have to double check before starting. So uh, you can see that I go next to the uh, JJ stand to put the safety wire, the um, hydrophilic safety wire. I don't go through the JJ stand because it's uh, uh, occupied uh, with uh, E. coli, so it's infected. So if you've got an infected JJ stand, it's better to go next to it than through it. Um, you can see here that the wire goes nicely next to the JJ stand, but you can see here also uh, a small kinking of the ureter. I thought that it was uh, uh, because of uh, the wire or the resistance, uh, or probably the J stand was a bit encrusted. Encrusted, sorry. So you can see here the dirty urine. Um, of course, uh, the JJ stand is infected. Uh, I remove uh, the uh, JJ stand, and this is uh, the biofilm that uh, uh, you see. It's, uh, it's uh, the yellow color, more dark, the biofilm, in comparison uh, with the white color of the stand. So after three weeks, uh, the lower loop of the JJ stand uh, was uh, covered with uh, biofilm. And this is a problem with recurrent uh, uh, UTIs and uh, with carriers of uh, bacteria. I usually uh, follow the railway technique. That means uh, that uh, I usually insert a second uh, uh, hydrophilic wire and I go in between. Uh, and this helps me, especially when I don't have a JJ stand uh, uh, in place, and uh, I can dilate better the ureter. So in this case, where I was, I was uh, sure that I would be able uh, to go up, I was stuck. So at this, uh, 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 in this case, uh, I overestimated uh, uh, things, and I thought uh, that uh, I could easily uh, go up with a uteroscope, but I couldn't go up. You remember the kinking? I couldn't go up with a semi rigid uh, uteroscope, so I thought that I would put uh, my access in. The access is that I uh, use routinely is a 10 12 access. I'm not using uh, uh, bigger accesses because uh, there are. Uh, many reports uh, with uh, abrasion or other uh, kind of injury of the ureter. So I use the 1012 uh, accessive. There is also a 911 French accessive, that it's even better. Um, so I said that I'm going to put uh, straight away my accessive. The problem was that again, the accessive could not. Uh, uh, overcome the kinking and could not be advanced inside the, uh, the upper ureter. So I ended up with a problem. And uh, when you have a problem, you need to find a solution. In endourology, you are alone. So you have to uh, make a quick decision uh, how to deal with the case. So as I could not advance the accessive, you know, the accessive has an inner part and an outer, uh, outer part. I decided at least to dilate uh, the access, the, the access, the ureter. So I had a go with the inner part of the accessive. And uh, uh, fortunately, the inner part uh, could uh, go up. The inner part is more tapered and uh, it's uh, thinner. So I dilated a bit the ureter with the inner part of the axis up to the stone. So my only um, solution was uh, to go with the disposable scope upwards without an axis. Because I was using the 7.5 friends, I thought that this would be 
easy enough and uh, it was. Uh, so this is an advantage of the new uh, thinner, flexible, disposable scope. Uh, I did white balance. Uh, I uh, actually advanced uh, the uh, scope over my hydrophilic wire. I kept the other wire because it helps uh, for uh, everything to go upwards easily. And it went easily up to the stone. So I removed the, the uh, wire and I inserted the laser. Here is the Traxxer uh, pump where you can uh, apply a bit of pressure to see better. But you have to be very, very cautious uh, when you uh, put a lot of pressure at your irrigation. Uh, so you can see that I'm uh, at the edge of the stone. Uh, it's a long stone. And uh, you can see that the angle is not ideal. Uh, you have to be aware of the different uh, uh, exit of the laser inside the scope. Uh, and I'm saying this because uh, with the uh, push and scope, uh, you've got uh, uh, the laser and other accessories coming out from uh, three o'clock. There are some other scopes uh, that uh, uh, the accessories, laser, etc., come out from nine o'clock. So uh, this is why, uh, in some cases, you have to have uh, disposable scopes from different companies when you want to treat um, stones in the right or the left kidney. These are tips and tricks uh, that I'm sure that you are aware of. Uh, I use the 365 laser fiber. You know that uh, in the uh, uh, reusable uh, reels, you use uh, thinner fiber in order not to damage your scope. But uh, with uh, disposable scopes, uh, you've got an advantage of using uh, bigger instruments uh, and lasers. And in this case, where you've got a star hole, uh, it's advisable to use uh, the big laser fiber. Lights are off, and uh, you can see the uh, curve of the scope. Uh, the good news is that the stone is not so hard. I believe that 1,000 uh, household units was overestimated by our colleagues. Uh, so I uh, laser the stone. I'm trying to do the uh, painting technique. But uh, uh, when you are using a high settings to go quicker, you will have also uh, big fragments. Uh, for the painting uh, technique, the dusting technique, uh, you need uh, high frequency and low energy. Uh, so slowly I go up. I'm trying to uh, don't miss uh, big fragments because uh, if you don't do this uh, in a methodological way, then you will get lost and the big fragments will be in several calluses. After usually uh, 10 minutes, I cut the edge of the uh, fiber and I'm not uh, uh, degloving the tip of the uh, fiber. And this is because I position the edge of my fiber close to my scope to control my lasering. And uh, if uh, you um, cut the blading of the tip, you may laser your scope. So I'm uh, uh, using in this uh, example of stage the tip a bit forward uh, because it's not easy to get my scope there. But you can see that uh, 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 the tip is cut and uh, uh, I continue nicely. I take uh, uh, consideration where my safety wire is uh, in order not to laser the wire, because then you end up uh, to have to remove uh, a piece of your wire. 
You can see here that I progress slowly. Of course, the urine uh, is cloudy. Now I'm uh, changing um, uh, my settings and I'm uh, in increasing frequency and energy because I've got a big stone and I'm at the position actually to carry on in one session because you remember my initial plan was to have two sessions of reels, but uh, if you are uh, uh, doing something quickly, try to do it in one go. This is an infectious case. That means that uh, if you've got a big residual uh, stone to deal after a few weeks, then the risk of urosepsis will be doubled. Um, so I carry on. The vision is quite uh, good. Uh, so that means uh, that the thinner scope uh, has a good efficacy, a good flow, good vision. Uh, and uh, you can see here that uh, the long part of the uh, stone has been completely lasered. And we've got now the upper part with the branches that occlude uh, the calyces. So uh, you may ask, of course, uh, how much time I would spend in this case where I've got an active UTI. In general, my uh, upper limit uh, is uh, uh, 1.5 hours. But if I use low pressure and I'm happy, I may go up to two hours. My advice to young urologists uh, and colleagues would be one hour because if you work more, you will use sometimes a bit more pressure and you may have a reflux, backflow, and uh, urosepsis. So you have to be very cautious with reefs and urosepsis. So I continue, I carry on. My aim was to free the entrance of the calyces. So you can see here that uh, here is the entrance of one of the three upper calyces where I'm trying to free them because we had uh, dirty urine uh, to drain. Uh, so it went quite uh, well. And uh, uh, you can see here that we have uh, three big uh, uh, stone fragments, but slowly uh, we carry on. I haven't injected any contrast, uh, but um, as I'm approaching the occluded calluses, I wanted to double check that I haven't uh, perforated uh, with my uh, pressure. Usually I use gravity pressure. So it's the uh, first uh, uh, point where I'm gonna inject a bit of uh, contrast to orientate myself also. So you can see that uh, the uh, uh, contrast goes to the part of the uh, long uh, staghorn stone, and I don't have uh, uh, extravasation. So I, I put uh, a couple of cc's of uh, contrast. Uh, I'm not a big fan of doing uh, uh, contrast studies from the very beginning. If my wires easily curve in the kidney. But of course, uh, when you are in any doubt, uh, you have to inject contrast. So you can see here uh, two uh, big uh, stone fragments. Um, this is the Traxor pump, where you can see that uh, uh, very uh, meticulously, I press a bit. If you press a lot, you may uh, be in trouble. And uh, regarding the, the maneuvers that you use to uh, do your uh, rears, you can see here that uh, you are using both hands. Usually if you are right-handed, the left hand will be used to stabilize your scope, especially when you don't have an access and go in and out. And you're gonna use your dominant hand and uh, you have to do movements not only with your thumb up and down, but also with your wrist. This will change the angle. And here I actually advance uh, through my scope uh, a wire to uh, be able 
to uh, uh, go to other calluses. And either I use a wire through my scope or I just advance the wire that I've got next to the scope. Because wires are slippery, hydrophilic, and they may enter calluses that uh, I cannot uh, uh, find easily. So you remember the curve in this uh, direction. Here is uh, the curve of the wire upwards. So I advance the wire and I follow the wire. And next to the wire, according to the fluoroscopy, I can see better the stone that I have to laser. And uh, this helps me uh, to uh, don't uh, leave pieces inside. Uh, so I'm done uh, after uh, uh, nearly uh, one and a half hours. When I come out, I always uh, put again my second wire in uh, because if I've got any injury in the ureter, it's uh, safer to have two wires in place. So I come out, I check the ureter, but uh, for sure, I wouldn't have any problem because I didn't use an accessive. Uh, you can see a lot of uh, uh, dust from the infectious stone. And uh, you can see the result of uh, uh, the fragmentation. This case uh, was uh, uh, in April uh, last year. And you can see my JJ stent. So after nearly 1.5 hours, uh, I check uh, the disposable scope uh, efficacy. You can see that I have a good deflection, 270 both sides, and uh, this is good. I also put the laser inside, and again, the deflection is not decreased. Uh, so here is uh, 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 the movement up and down, and here is uh, the movement inside the axis that I couldn't manage to advance, but you can see that uh, uh, the scope is quite uh, uh, thin. Uh, so this was uh, quite a, a challenging case uh, that went quite well and the patient was uh, uh, stone free after I did a CT a couple of uh, weeks afterwards and uh, hopefully she was also uh, E. coli free. So uh, I don't have time to show you another video, but I'm happy for the last 10 minutes to uh, take any questions and discuss whatever you want. I, I, I hope you enjoyed the video. Thank you. Wonderful. Uh, very good demonstration, uh, Professor Papasaurus, on uh, this uh, rather difficult situation. Very unusual shape of the stone. Uh, we have quite a few questions, and I'll, I'll quickly uh, ask these questions. One is, uh, any idea how much this scope costs to the hospital or to the patient? Yes. Um, in, uh, in general, the uh, ocean scopes are cheaper than the Boston Scientific ones. But the new 7.5 scope uh, is actually close to the price of the leaf of view. Uh, the leaf of view is uh, larger, it's nine frames, this is 7.5. So what I know from the company is uh, that they're trying to make it uh, uh, near the cost of the older uh, scope by Boston Scientific in order to have some competition. Of course, uh, it's different uh, if uh, uh, the hospital is going to buy the scope and it's different if the patient is going to buy the scope because uh, it's a matter of the order. The more scopes, the cheaper it is. But the price, uh, as far as I know, is close to the little few months. Thank you. Right. Um, one important issue is about these upper polar calicial stones, particularly if you have to go through the infundibulum. Uh, uh, we know that uh, there is a vessel crossing the upper polar calyx infundibulum quite closely. And that's why percutaneous approaches uh, down that track is something that one should avoid. Any special consideration during uh, flexible ureteroscopy? Yes. Um... 
Uh, first of all, I didn't say number. So uh, in euros, the little view costs around uh, 1,200 euros. And uh, the uh, second generation pusher scope is around 800 euros. So 1,000 to 1,200. Now, regarding this very good question, regarding um, uh, tips and tricks uh, to deal with uh, these uh, cases, and um, I always uh, uh, laser the, the, the middle of the stone, and uh, I'm very cautious uh, when uh, I'm very close to the urothelium. Uh, especially when you've got uh, hard stones, you're going to put uh, um, uh, high energy and you may be in trouble with uh, bleeding. Uh, so when you are uh, uh, in the infundibulum, which is occupied by a stone, the tip is to always laser uh, from the middle uh, towards the periphery and not from the periphery towards the, the middle. Once you are in, it's easier, but you have to take into consideration the anatomy um, of the uh, kidney. Uh, but the percutaneous access uh, is very, very difficult uh, for sure. I, I believe that you agree, don't you? Yeah, I mean, uh, although uh, there are proponents of uh, mini perk in that uh, location, uh, and I know that you are a very uh, good uh, percutaneous surgeon as well. Um, I mean, if you have a one to two centimeter stone, is it the location or some anatomical factors uh, that you decide either to go for mini perk versus uh, flexible urotroscopy? I believe that the trend now is to do more cases uh, uh, from below through the natural orifice. Um, and uh, if you question yourself, uh, uh, as you are a very uh, experienced surgeon, what would you prefer someone else to do to you? I'm sure that uh, uh, most of us would say that I would prefer to have uh, one or even two stages of rears. Always with the percutaneous axis, even if it's the mini axis, you have a chance of uh, uh, something getting wrong. I, I'm a big fan of uh, rears, especially single-use uh, rears. You have a brand new instrument. Our lasers are excellent. So uh, nothing can go wrong, or even if something goes wrong, you abandon, you put the JJ stent. But with um, uh, PERC, uh, you don't go through a natural orifice, uh, and uh, this is a violation of nature. So maybe uh, this may answer at least in part your question. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I think it's only the Italian young man would not like to go through that path. It's uh, uh, all the rest of the world would like to go through that natural orifice. Yes. Uh, so there's a, another question about use of access sheath. Now this is a big stone, although it came out to be much softer than what you expected through the Hounsfield. But uh, still, you took about uh, 90 minutes, one and a half hours, uh, uh, if I remember correctly. Yes. Uh, yes. How worried were you without an access sheet, uh, although it's a 7.5 French scope dilated ureter, how worried you were about the intra-renal pressure rise? Yes, I, I was uh, very worried. And that's why uh, I was uh, stopping in between. Now I was emptying a bit uh, the system. Uh, so this is another uh, tip and trick uh, to deal with. And uh, until we've got uh, new scopes that uh, will have a tracer of uh, pressure and, and temperature on the tip, we have to be very cautious uh, because uh, uh, patient, uh, patients may die from urosepsis. They may not die from bleeding, they may die from urosepsis. So you have to be very, very uh, cautious. Uh, I worked with the minimum pressure that I could work, and um, sometimes uh, I could uh, laser uh, just by touching the stone, even if the vision was not excellent. But for young colleagues, uh, the advice is uh, always to operate in a safe environment and make sure that you can see adequately enough 
but don't uh, uh, apply huge irrigation pressure just to see because uh, this uh, will uh, end up with eurosepsis. You have to take this into account. Thank you. Great, thanks. A uh, couple of more questions. Uh, I think it has generated really a lot of enthusiasm among our young uh, urologists who are doing or starting to do our ARS. So um, are there any telltale signs to know that your intra-renal pressure is going up Although it's a close environment and it's really, very difficult to say as long as you're seeing well uh, and there is no visible hematuria, uh, how, would, how would you know that uh, the intrarenal pressure is going up? Only, only if you put a bit of contrast uh, uh, and uh, then you will see that uh, you have uh, uh, the reflux uh, and the extravasation. Uh, it's a matter of experience. Um, Usually, when you put a lot of pressure, when uh, you, the pressure is a bit reduced, you have bleeding from uh, uh, the vacuum effect. So, uh, until I said before, we have tracers of pressure and temperature, uh, we are not 100% uh, sure. Also, it depends with the system. If the system uh, is occupied uh, by the soul, and you apply high pressures, uh, then uh, you may have uh, uh, highest pressure than when the system is dilated and you are at the end of the process. So at the beginning of the operation, uh, the risks are more in comparison with the end of the operation. You used, uh, Thanos, you used uh, 365. I know that uh, the fiber degradation is, is much less with this uh, fiber rather than the 200 micron fibers. But um, if, if your stones had dropped into the lower pole calyx or you have to bend your scope significantly, would you be concerned about using a 365 fiber? I try with a 365. I mean, if I can't make it, I'm going to change uh, to the 200. But uh, I'm not using the 200 uh, uh, from the beginning uh, for sake of time. And because it's uh, a disposable scope, as I said before, I'm not afraid of uh, damaging the uh, scope working channel. And as you can see, the working channel was good and the view was uh, uh, good. So even with thinner scopes, you may have a very good result. Great. There's an interesting question about uh, use of a percutaneous nephrostomy to keep the intrarenal pressure low during RIRS? And yes, uh, yes, I mean, uh, this is theoretically correct, but uh, if you manage to put uh, uh, percutaneous um, nephrostomy uh, inside the upper system, why wouldn't you go ahead with the percutaneous uh, operation? So it's a, it's a theoretical uh, approach, but it's not a practical approach, to be honest. Thank you. Right. Uh, I think you have uh, very adequately addressed all the questions and we have gone beyond uh, the flexible uh, disposable scopes uh, to the whole art of uh, flexible urotroscopy and stone fragmentation. Uh, thank you very much for a wonderful talk as always, Thanos. It's always a pleasure having you and uh, I'm sure that uh, like me, all our delegates have really enjoyed your wonderful presentation and the description, video description of the case. Hope to have you back again uh, in, in this course later sometime in the year. So enjoy the rest of your weekend. And again, thank you very much for uh, your wonderful input on this issue. Thank you very much. Uh, first of all, for your friendship and uh, uh, I'm always available and I will be more than happy to see you live. So all the best and uh, stay safe. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. So, uh, Delegate, this is the uh, next conceptual base course, which is uh, on the first Saturday of February. Uh, the date is uh, 5th of February. It's very difficult to... Um, forget this date for most people in Pakistan. So 5th of February is the day for um, the next course.
Saturday, 7 p.m. And our speaker is Dr. Zishan Aslam, who is going to talk about uh, <clears throat> the cytoreductive nephrectomy, and particularly in the era of the Sotime and the Carmina trial, uh, which have really changed or at least challenged the surgeons uh, doing cytoreductive nephrectomy rather than using a systemic therapy. So Nishan is going to bring some cases and talk about cytoreductive nephrectomy in the post-Carmina and Sotime trial. <clears throat> so thank you very much and have a very good evening and uh, you've all been a uh, very good audience and uh, I'm really hopeful that you've enjoyed this course. And uh, hopefully if uh, Professor Papasaurus agrees, this course will be available on our Karachi website. Uh, and uh, like all the previous courses and see you on 5th of February, 7 p.m. Until then, Khuda Hafiz.